Thank you so much. Um, well, I will open it up for council members um, who would like to begin. You each have 11 minutes. I'm looking. I'm looking for my WebEx. So if, if Ms. Walsh is raising, raising her hand, I'm not seeing it. But that's because I can't find the right tab. Okay, I'm happy to start since I only have 11 minutes. I'm going to read all my questions first, and I hope that those of you who I'm asking to answer questions will remember the questions and give me succinct answers so that I can get the information that I need since I am limited in the amount of time that I'm being given to ask these questions. So I haven't started your time yet, so just to clarify, you have 11 minutes for question and answer. If you have additional, you can certainly email for follow-up um, or anything like that. I understand like what you're saying. Okay, sure. Which I think is somewhat outrageous, but I will continue. Um, so here are the questions I have to Patuxent Commons. Um, in September, on September 1st, 2020, a letter of support from County Exec to in a letter of support to County Executive Ball, it states the project would result in 54 affordable units and 22 market rate units. Can you explain why that number has changed? Um, and this is a financing question. Please provide the total amount of county financing that the project will receive, including gap financing, MIHU, fee and lieu, and foregone pilot revenue. Um, the next question is, how is a senior defined? Is that somebody over 55, over 60, over 65? Um, the next question is, um, I am not sure what a mixed income uh, development is when there are only seven market rate units out of the 76. Um, the next question is, why is the cost per unit greater for Patuxent Commons when compared to Rosalind Rise? And for your information, um, I think that the Roslyn Rise was um, $424,117 per unit in the development, and Patuxent Commons is $488,777 per unit to be developed. Um, to Mr. Brownow, I have a number of questions. For the student yield calculations, are you consistently using the same projects, which seem to be Monarch Mills and Burgess Mills for every APFA waiver request? Are there any new affordable housing projects that could be used in those projections? How have the student yield projections in Monarch Mills and Burgess Mills Station compared to the actuals? And in your memo regarding Patuxent Commons student yield and the APFA waiver, you state that Howard County Public Schools will be conducting a redistricting process and that is likely that a capacity at Clemens Crossing will be adjusted during that process. Um, is that based on conversations you've had with the public schools because the um, school board has specifically voted not to do any kind of redistricting outside what will be needed for High School 13? Um, let's see. Uh, Swansfield, uh, most of these projections have these students going to Swansfield, which also has much greater needs with a higher percentage of students enrolled in farm. Some of the adjacent, adjacent polygons between the school historically have greater concentration of farm students. Is the capacity solution we are saying that exists going to increase the concentration of poverty in a Title I school? I guess that would be for um, the school district. Um, then also for school planning, uh, the question for school planning in the assignment of relocatable classroom reports, um, there was a request for more portables from Clemens Crossing that was denied two years in a row. What are the typical barriers to providing portables requested by principals to our county council vice chair? We held a public hearing on CR 29 along with other current legislation but we did not hold a specific hearing on the questions enumerated in the code, which we are required to hold. Um, this meeting discussing these issues is important, but it is not a public hearing. When will we be holding a public hearing on these questions? Okay, that's it. So can, I guess we will start with Patuxent Commons. Sure, hi, this is Elizabeth with Mission First. Um, so the change in the affordability mix 
is due to the fact we were initially pursuing 9% low income housing tax credits. Those are very competitive. They used to have a set aside of one project a year for um, 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 uh, people with disabilities. Um, that was eliminated the year that we applied. And um, so we were not successful in receiving 9% credits. Um, that was in September or the announcements were in late uh, 2020. So we have revamped the project for 4% low income housing tax credits. They're not as valuable. Um, so we have to raise more money. And one of the results of that was we couldn't include as many market rate units. Although it seems counterintuitive, um, we raised low income housing tax credit equity on the um, on only the affordable units. And so that outside equity um, cannot, cannot be generated on the market rate units. And so we've done a careful calibration. Um, that was the most market rate units that we can pro provide. Um, again, every additional market rate unit put us actually more in the hole. So we are planning to try and introduce 80% AMI units. That's um, an even higher level of workforce housing, but there's an, there's a recent IRS ruling that, um, um, put that into question. So we, we've left that category though, hopefully once that, that gets finalized. So um, that's, that's the reason for the change in the unit mix, but we still think it's a significant um, mix at the property. How is this, um, can I, I, I'm sorry, but because I only have 11 minutes and there's only five minutes and 34 seconds less left, I would like you to, uh, I'm going to have to ask people to make their answers as quick as possible. So how is a senior defined? Um, 62 and over. Thank you. What is the co why is the cost per unit so much greater for Patuxent Commons than Roslyn Rise? Um, well, there's probably a lot of reasons. Um, we have a high site acquisition cost. We have a limited number of units. Um, they, I believe, are a twinning deal, which has 9% and 4% credits. And as I mentioned, the 9% are more valuable. So, um, and also, um, we have some significant um, we have underground parking that we're adding. We have significant infrastructure. We're going to be needing to um, add a sewer connection to the site um, down Freetown Road. So, um, so those I think are some of the reasons why the cost per unit are, are not exactly comparable. Thank you, Mr. Bronow. Can I, I see you in the back there. Can I call you up to answer the questions that I've asked? The first one being um, the question about student yields from the um, Burgess Mills Station and Monarch Mills. The second one being why you think that there might be a greater redistricting other than just what is happening with High School 13. Do you have inside information about that? To answer that, no. When, when this memo was written in uh, January, mm -hmm. um, I just put that together because I knew redistricting was going to happen. Um, it was a major redistricting, so I was assuming that that could happen, that there could be an elementary school redistricting. But you probably have more accurate information, given this was written back in January. Okay. And your Burgess Mills, Monarch Mills, um, is there anything new to add to the fact that you continue to use that as your projection for the um, number of students? Yeah, not really. Just out? trying to be consistent with these other studies that we did using those two because they are mixed income, um, low income housing tax credit projects. They have a mix of one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom. So it looked like a fair comparison to use those as samples. Um, some other recent projects um, that you're aware of, Robinson Overlook, that was actually just completed in July 2021. So very likely it didn't have full lease up by September 30th of this year to use that as a sample. But we could certainly look and talk to the school system to see what the yield is in that project. That would be helpful. Yeah. Yes, um, which is why I have CB9 out there, so that this would happen naturally before we have a hearing. Um, I think those are the only questions that I have for you. Um, okay. I don't know if, if Dan Lubley is on the screen or Tim Rogers, Tim Rogers, one of them. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member Young. I am here. This is Dan Lubley, Director of Capital Planning and Construction. Um, I first like to note that, as Mr. Bronow noted, when the his initial memo was written on January 4th, that was prior to the Board of Education uh, making their motion with regards to the scope of the upcoming redistricting. So the timing of the two uh, were just offset. 
I would like to note that as currently in the long range master plan for the capital budget, we do have elementary school 43, which would be a new facility, which would also require a boundary adjustment. So that potentially there's no guarantee, but that potentially could affect this area at the elementary school at that point. 43 is Turf Valley, correct? No, 43 is currently to be located at Mission Road. 44 oh, Mission would Road. be Turf Valley. Okay. Yes, ma'am. No, that's pretty far away. Um, With and, regards to your other, sorry, go ahead. Well, um, I, I was just, I don't see how that could really impact it, but go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, with regards to your other question, you were asking specifically about the relocatable, requ re relocatable request by the individual principals. Our office of school planning does work as the relocatable requests do come in from the principals to work with the schools to determine what the requests are specifically uh, related for and how those requests might be utilized or better identified within the school. With regards to Clemens Crossing specifically, it was looked at and with the three portables they currently have, it was determined that the utilization rate for the school is at 91.8%. Therefore, they were below the 100% with the current relocatables. I could definitely talk with Mr. Rogers in the Office of School Planning, provide you a more detailed response if you would like. So without the portables, they're at 106%, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, then um, I guess the other question I have is, um, I ask about the farms rate, and I guess I really the question is, when you increase the farms rate at a school, do you increase the amount of resources to that school? That's a very good question. That's a, a question that I would have to get further detail with different departments. I will note that when the farms does reach a certain point, it does become eligible for to become title one which does a lot of times increase the assistance it does not necessarily guarantee that it goes that way but it does provide that opportunity but again i do not have that specific information off the top of my head and would have to get that with other departments okay i think swansfield is already a title one school and then my last question I is to our, our vice chair and that is do we have a plan for the hearing the special hearing on the APFA waiver process for this particular project? I think that'd be best suited for Office of Law. Um, I, I don't it, think that I- It is the law. <laughs> it is the law. Sure, so again, if you're asking a legal question, which would be about when hearings occur and when they happen, I think that would be best directed to Office of Law and I'm happy to follow up with you after we hear from them. I'm not asking a legal question. I'm asking a scheduling question because the law specifically states that we have to have a hearing on this. Okay, so it sounds like I should follow up with Office of Law and then we can all circle back. Uh, Ms. Harrod? I, I believe but it would um, be clarification with Ms. Myhill. I don't know if Mr. Cook is on, but Ms. Myhill, when we had the public hearing for the um, legislation, those those points are taken under consideration during that public hearing for the legislation. Okay, great. So we, we will get more, we'll discuss that more and, and find out if um, Ms. Young's concern has been addressed or for the law, not if her concern has been addressed. Um, and then we'll follow up. Would Mr. Youngman yeah. or Ms. Walsh like to go next? Ms. Walsh is welcome to go next if she'd like. All right, I'll go. Thank you, Mr. Yearman. All right, thank you, Ms. Walsh. Um, uh, my first question, I understand we have some board members, is that right, in the, um, in the Banneker room with us? Okay, I, I would like to, well, actually, before we even get to the board members, but maybe they can make their way up to the front. Um, I would like to say that I, I very much appreciate the way that Patuxent Commons has approached um, particular pilot legislation. And I think it is important for us as the reviewing body, as the approving body on something like a pilot, that we have a uh, last month's bill asking for the gap financing and this month's bill uh, identifying 
um, the pilot funds that will be received. And in the course of that legislation is when we got more details about what particularly was being proposed here at Patuxent Commons um, and why. Uh, and so even that presentation that was made at the beginning, our D1 office received that personally, and uh, I'm hopeful that's already in the related documents, but that was a lot of information that we were trying to track down as part of last month's budget bill um, that happily is now there. Uh, the converse of that is we have no such information from Randley Court. Uh, I know that in the process of trying to draft amendments to last month's bill, we've asked uh, our legislative analysts for that. And to a certain extent, we have pursued it. But I um, would be more than happy to set aside last month's gap financing for Randley Court until we have a comparable pilot before us um, for that um, project. I just put that out there. Uh, so then if I get to my first question, which goes to this notion of um, of what Ms. Heberhardt said is, I, I've spoken to Dr. Moderano, and he's willing to do whatever he can. What what is the import of that? I mean, how that I I appreciate that gesture, but the actual effect of it, I think, is right, virtually meaningless. What what role does Dr. Moderano have in redistricting, and on what time frame, and how it would address a particular project? If our board members, whether virtual or in, in the Banneker room, could speak to that, I I would like to hear about that. I think at least Ms. Catronio is on virtually. Correct. We have Ms. Catronio online. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm having all sorts of technical. What was your question, Ms. Walsh? I'm sorry. What role does Dr. Moderano and his agreement with the proponents of this project to um, to do whatever he can to redistrict in order to address you know potential overcrowding at these receiving schools? What what is the practical um, effect of that kind of statement by Dr. Moderano versus what actually has to happen um, through the school board or um, schools planning to actually affect that. Uh, redistricting is under the purview of the board, um, but that being said, I mean, I think he's probably knowing the um, lack of um, housing for um, people with disabilities in the county. It's very exciting um, as a um, landing spot for some of our students. So. Um, you know, I, I think it was sort of in theory, you know, he would do whatever he could, but the decision is to the board um, with redistricting. Um, but we can, you know, through the app, move them to another school if Clemens is, you know, overcrowded. Um, there are options, but, um, you know, as with all of these waivers, we have to look really carefully at it. Um, but to answer your question, not much. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Catronio. Are my colleagues in the boardroom? I can't see. Me neither. Oh, that's right. You're I don't, I don't believe so. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, then uh, my next question goes to this issue of student yields. And um, I, I pulled the student yield information that this council was given as part of its consideration of the Dorsey Overlook project. And as Ms. Young suggested in her um, earlier questioning, that project made much, or that project's calculations made much reference to Robinson Overlook, which at least in terms of size, seems more comparable to this proposed project than Monarch Mills or Burgess. And so was it, Miss? I'd like someone to speak to who actually prepared um, this student yield uh, calculation that's in, um, that's in this testimony submitted in support. Is that Mr. Bronow or is it Mr. DiLorenzo or someone else? Ms. Walsh, Mr. Bronow is approaching. Thank you. Ms. Walsh, can I add on to your question um, to make sure that the, what year they're talking about with the yield, is it the year that it opens or um, are they looking at years, the cumulative years? And we all know that the yield for the first year is not the impact. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Catronio. I think this is in reference. I also got an email from the um, county auditor's office on a spreadsheet for Dorsey Overlook. <clears throat> Is that what you're mm -hmm. referring to, Ms. Walsh? No, first of all, I wanna know who wrote this section of the, of the testimony and support that, that gives the, the student yield calculation um, here. And it starts on page four under subject criterion two, an appropriate measure to estimate the number of, um, and then it goes through uh, the second page or a second page to page five 
Did, did you prepare that, Mr. Bono? Well, I prepared a memo that's dated January 4th, 2022. I, didn't, I don't think I prepared the, what you're referring to. Okay, does the council have that memo? Question mark? I think it's part of the if It could be the, the same thing. Is it, is it, it could be that you're referencing that memo. Um, Mr. Bronow, this is Dan Mubley, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm, I believe I'm, it is referencing that memo. Yeah. Okay. We're four. talking about the same thing. Right, yeah. okay, then good. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, so I prepared okay. this. So, I prepared this memo. All right. Okay, and so in preparing this memo, you did not look at Robinson Overlook or you did not look at analysis that you did for this council in association with our consideration of Dorsey Overlook? So my question is, I, I was referring to this email I received, did the council consider Dorsey Overlook for a, for a pilot and a-, and a wait, um, Mr. Brownell, wait, I, I will answer that question, but my question goes back to what did, you did not consider Robinson Overlook as part of this. So I, I did not, and I saw the spreadsheet that I think you're referring to, and I did not prepare that. But I think that the analysis that whoever did that used the same type of analysis I did for a previous project. Okay, and so that's, I did, I, I sent that to auditors, and I was like, hey, look, there's a similar right. analysis. Yeah, okay. A similar size project that's, again, much more comparable to this project than Burgess Miller Monarch Mills. And we're going in a totally different direction this time around, right? If you're going to, if, if presentations are going to be made to this council, you're either going to need to wipe the slate clean in my little brain, or I'm going to go back and look at the last presentation that you made on this very same topic. And so I have a hard time reconciling um, student yield projections that we got back in 2020 to these that we get now. You know, I, I can't, it, at this point in time, we should just pull up the sheet and see, and now there should be like, a, you know, columns for each of these projects and actual um, uh, enrollments. And as Ms. Catronio said, not just for the first year, but for the cumulative effect of them as those projects fill in. But do, so, you, and I, you know, I just got the email this morning, but I understand your response, Mr. Brownout, to our auditors to be that you did not do any student yield calculation for Dorsey Overlook? So that, that spreadsheet was an interpretation of a, of a calculation I did for Dorsey Overlook. And I think that spreadsheet was prepared by the administration, but just to be clear, so on my original preparation for Dorsey Overlook, I did not include Robertson Overlook. And, and if you look closely at that spreadsheet, I believe if you look at the Robertson Overlook comparisons, those yields in Robinson Overlook were not empirical there because it wasn't even built yet. So I, that spreadsheet to me is very confusing. I don't know what, what the purpose of it is and what it references. So okay, the, the Robinson the Overlook- is now built. What's that? It is now built, right? It was, it was completed in July of 2021. So for the Patuxent Commons analysis, I used yields for September 30th, 2021. And Robinson Overlook probably wasn't even fully occupied by September 2021. So with the spreadsheet you're looking at, I don't know what those yields are based on, but it can't, it can't be Robinson Overlook because it wasn't built yet. Okay. So I think what All I was right, saying so to Ms. Ms. Young earlier was that now that it's, it's you know, into 2022, we could look at yields to see what Robinson Overlook is actually yielding now and, and add that to the comparison. Okay. But at the time, I would, I would be appreciative yeah, of that. Yeah. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm being serious. In, in any subsequent presentation to this council of these same kinds of calculations, I would expect the presentation to be cumulative in that we would see what was presented to us last time around. If we need to fix it because we did project something and now we have actuals, then we can. But, um, you know, it, it, we're now in a work session, and I, I this morning got the answer to my question about where's Robinson Overlook. Um, right. I don't yeah. know where I am in my time. That's a good suggestion. And yeah. now that now that Robinson Overlook okay. is is built, we could add that to the cumulative analysis for these in the future. And in addition to that, we could you know event when Rosalind Rise is built, we can do the same thing. Right. Yeah. I think. I mean. I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Right. It becomes formulaic. We just know what it looks like. 
Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, uh, so amendments. Um, I, uh, and I, I've told this to Ms. Everhart, uh, our office D1 is working on amendments to the prior gap fan financing um, bill, but I feel like it is tied to this pilot where we make as a condition of our approval that whatever these monies received are, are used for have to at least be close to what's being described to us and being approved. So in the case, right, of protection commons, I think it is this 25% disability um, housing that is, you know, the marquee of this project. But also the pretty universal or uniform balance across different income levels that your project is able to achieve. And so, again, we, we had that pretty clearly through these slides that, that you presented today and that our office received earlier, but um, we've been scrapping for that information. Um, and I think we have it from Ranley Court, but um, I'm not sure. Uh, and then, and then the last question is one that the auditor has prompted, and I don't know if you've said it in the financial analysis or you just mentioned it to me, Mr. Glendening, but if there is someone from the administration who can speak to, this is how, um, this is the right way that the county can subsidize these projects, that this is the right balance between the pilot tax credit side versus the gap, the gap financing, you know, straight, straight grant side. Do, I mean, do we have a formula or are we reacting to requests as they come in from given um, properties? All right, I'm looking around Ms. Walsh and I don't think that we have any, we have mostly sort of planning and zoning folks here versus um, housing finances, but I think that that would be a good follow-up one. Um, and Mr. DiLorenzo here? Oh, Ms. Simino's here actually on, um, she, she's on the call. Ms. Simino, could you address that oh, please? Mr. DiLorenzo is not here. He's not in the room. Mm -hmm. I, I see Craig Glendening is, is online. That's who you were asking, right? No, he's the one who put like that question in my head. And I, and I, I mentioned it to you, Ms. Everhart, you know, that um, okay. that if, if we gave you a bigger pot of money in the front end, do you, do you need less going, you know, going out 30 years or 20 years in the tax relief? Or, it, you know, how how is the county deciding this is the right balance between now money versus overtime money? Uh, if Ms. Simino can answer that, that's great. I don't, Mr. Ingle, I don't know. I mean, uh, what I can say, uh, Ms. Walsh, is that pilots are a common form of uh, a co common component of low income tax credit financing. So the state did give the developer credit for having requesting a pilot, and it is part of their financing. So the ongoing support is needed regarding the gap financing. Uh, as we mentioned, they are under contract to acquire this property. And uh, they would like to do so before the contract expires. So it was based on a request made from the developer. Um, there is, to my, not to my knowledge, a, a certain percentage that's gap financing and a certain percentage that's pilot. To my understanding, there's no set formula. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Youngman? Oh. Mr. Glendening, did you want to add? All right. Mr. Youngman, the floor is yours. Can, can Mission or somebody provide us with a simple spreadsheet that is, um, you know, what, what, what your projected property taxes would be over 40 years without the pilot, sort of the, that gross amount that the county's giving up, um, you know, whether or not that includes inflation or whether that's a static number, and then below that, what's the projected... Um, surplus cash flow, because my understanding is we are going to get some surplus cash flow on this, which is great. Um, and then below that should be what it's costing us net over that 40 years. Um, that, I think that has been provided. That that has? Okay. Well, I don't think the auditor has that. Uh, they do. <laughs> huh? Uh, yeah, we, we spent several hours going over that. Um, spreadsheet. So I'm happy to just okay. send it to you directly. Um, I think just one thing to note is that this property can actually only be built with residential housing if it's affordable. So, um, you know, um, so, it, you know, saying like what this would be at market rate without a pilot is kind of, it's, it's not necessarily a fair comparison because you can only build affordable housing here. So 
um, you know, just wanted to make that comment, but I'm happy to send you the, the, the spreadsheet that, that laid that out. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not really questioning the economics. I'm kind of going down the same road that Ms. Walsh was, but this prop just for the public, this, this property could be rezoned as anything at any point in time. So, you know, we, we should always be, be looking at that. Um, does the, um, so there's only six out of the 76, seven out of the 76 units are market. H how are we able to have such a low amount of market rate units in, we, we, we keep hearing that these projects are supposed to be, uh, not 50-50, but, but, but approaching that, are supposed to be really mixed. So how, how is it working that only seven out of 76 are market? Um, so as I mentioned, Earlier in the presentation, um, we actually get long-term housing tax credit equity from an investor for every affordable unit in the project. Um, and if a project, if a unit is not affordable, we don't get equity on that unit. So the way these these um, units, these projects are structured, we actually lose money when we include market rate units. We can't charge true market rate um, rents because of the mixed income nature of the building. And each additional market unit actually creates a larger gap in the project for us that we then need to fill. Um, and yeah, it you're sounds right. crazy that, was... that you need. So, so you know, you have to go fundraise to include more right market rate units. It is counterintuitive. So yeah. we've tried to provide a good balance. The 80% AMI units, if we can include those, the rents would actually be the same as the market rate rents. Um, they would just be restricted to people earning 80% of area median income, which is, is fairly high. Um, and the market ones would actually just be unrestricted. So you would have no income limits um, to rent a unit there. Yeah. So it is counterintuitive that the Autism Society and, and others have really been pushing us to try and include more market rate units. But um, this is really the best balance that we could strike because we already just have tapped so many sources. Right. Yeah, I, I get why from the financing you want as many of the low income units as, as you want. And I'm glad you pointed out that it is counterintuitive, but it makes perfect sense. But from a policy perspective, we keep being told that the federal government, state, everybody wants us away from these projects that are predominantly low income. And it just seems like this is 90% low income. How, from a policy perspective, was that possible? But I, because we're time limited, I don't want to really get too far into it. Um, so the covenants on the property, on the project, um, in the pilot agreement for the disability housing, um, is that no more than 30% AMI? Do I have that right? Yes. For, the, for the disability folks? <laughs> what happens if somebody's yes. there and they start making more than that? Um, the you cannot kick them out. Um, you can encourage them to move, um, but you, you can't evict them. So that's a typical um, thing that happens. What we can also do sometimes is try and move them if their income high enough into one of the 60% AMI categories without actually moving their unit and redesignate a new unit, lower income. So it's called the next available unit rule. That's something our property managers are familiar with. Okay. And, and then I have a question on, and on the upfront funding as well. Um, so one of the things I think that I've brought up is, um, you know, the county's gonna gonna fund uh, like 3.2 million bucks into this project this summer, and the property's gonna get acquired, right? That's our hope, yes. Okay, if then eight months later when the financing's supposed to close, if we can't close the financing, we lost the tax credit, God knows what happens in the financial markets, but somehow the thing can't get done, how does the county get the money back? Um, so, you know, our intent was that we would have that housing commission form the partnership with us when we purchased the property. And so, um, you know, to pursue residential on this site, the housing commission needs to be involved. And so if for some reason, um, you know, mission first couldn't complete the deal, then they could find another partner to complete the deal with them. Um, so I think that's, that is the, the backup. So the housing commission essentially, or, or whatever joint venture gets created between you guys and the housing commission 
would basically be sitting on the property trying to figure out what to do with it next. Is that right? Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think there would be some sort of covenant and then it would be, you know, I mean, it's up to the county, of course, because it's, it's their money being involved, but, um, you know, what those strings attached would be. Okay. You know, but, our, our intent, of course, is, is, is to build this exact project. So. I know. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, I think this might be a little bit for um, Ms. Ballinger or Ms. Klutz um, or even Mr. Dunham, but I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the inception process um, when you first started looking at this back in 2012. I think one of the things that's consistently so unique about this project is that it's community driven. There are a group of parents who said, we have this problem, we want to figure out the solution, um, and then a decade later, here we are. So if you could um, talk a little bit about that, I think that'd be very helpful for me. So I, I can start, Debbie, do you wanna start? Sure. I can speak to this uh, a bit because I've been volunteering with uh, the Autism Society, gosh, for 20 years now. I don't know if you can, okay, sorry, sorry, Mark. So, you know, we had an adult issues. Oh, okay. Oh, this is fine, okay, yeah. So we, we uh, had an adult issues and transition committee because the population of um, children aging out of the school system with disabilities is just growing and growing. And so um, our group met and uh, we had housing as a subject and the room was packed. And uh, like myself, my family, there are so many others that how do we help our um, young adults grow as independent as they can, be a part of the community that they live in now in, the, in our wonderful Howard County. And um, we started looking around, and that became a subcommittee that started meeting to say, you know, there isn't much here in affordable housing. Um, the federal government is um, wanting um, group homes to close because they're congregant housing, and that's something that um, many of us really don't uh, want our, our children in because it's not uh, a healthy environment. A healthy environment is being part of the community. And um, growing, and, and I can assure you, my son, who's 24, has grown so much by being a part of that Hickory Ridge community. And so um, we grew, uh, we, we brought in housing experts, we looked across the nation at the best practices for housing for people with disabilities, and we found that is the best practice is um, intentional housing where someone with a disability is in a community with uh, non-disabled people and how do you provide that support and so uh, we worked with uh, generations of hope uh, a nonprofit group and um, kept pulling in experts to help us uh, develop uh, best practices and, and thinking um, well senior citizens that's certainly a, a growing need also for housing especially in howard county and how do you create that community of mutual support? So um, where it's intentional, it's mutual, and um, it is uh, good for the community. So that's kind of how we got where we are. And then yeah, I would say four years ago, we, we created a larger task force that was not specific to autism. It is uh, multi-disability, uh, and we pulled in business leaders, some government, uh, leaders in Howard County uh, to work with us and we ended up selecting Mission First Housing um, as a partner because it really is far beyond the Autism Society, the, um, uh, the need to uh, have this expertise. So uh, Teresa, what could you add to that? Um, uh, the, the, the one thing I wanted to say um, is that we draw from our experiences and um, 
we we knew what 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 our small group knew um, in the beginning, the housing subcommittee, and then with um, some expertise from Generations of Hope, we we branched out into what was needed beyond us, and we learned more. And as we build this community, we're going to learn again. And there'll be people watching us to see what worked with Patuxent Commons and what needs to be tweaked and move on. And that's why we hone on the innovation and the movement that we have here. It, it is really important because there are people out there looking for something new and different, an option for their adult with disabilities, where they're going to live and just want a new uh, and innovative idea. Thank you. Um... I remember when you all presented at the Changemaker Challenge, and I found it so inspiring. And so it's really exciting to, to have you before us today. Um, what are some of the time constraints that you are facing? And I don't know if this is more for Elizabeth or Mark on this, but um, what are the time constraints that you're now facing to keep everything going to achieve the project? Elizabeth probably um, would be best to sure, I, respond. I, sure, I can jump in. Um, so, um, you know, obviously for us, we have sunk a lot of um, money into the project to get to this point. However, to really let loose all of our consultants to do the design, we want to make sure that the, that the uh, pilot and Apple Wave are going to be approved. We don't want to spend $2 million to design a project if, um, if at the end we're not going to be able to have it move forward. Um, we do have sources that we've applied for that uh, are waiting, you know, patiently for us and they will provide extensions. Um, you know, it's Maryland Department of Health, HUD 811, we have private foundations, of course, we have the county, we have the state. Um, so um, we have federal, some federal earmarks. Um, so really just bringing all those sources together. And, and also we want to make sure that we can acquire this site. So this site specifically, of course, we're designing for this site. We think the site location is so ideal. And it, um, while the, the seller has been, um, has provided some extensions. We don't think he's going to go much past this summer. So we really think, you know, nailing down the site is really key to us moving forward. And then, of course, these approvals to really unleashing all the design work that needs to be, um, you know, that needs to happen to get to, um, to get to closing. Thank you, um, Elizabeth. This one's also probably for you. But I was <laughs> reading through our auditor's report. And I noticed that um, you received about 2.3 million in Maryland Green Partnership funds. Can you talk a bit more about this award um, and what did the criteria, what criteria did the project need to meet in order to receive this environmental award? Um, so we have, um, there are a variety of different types of funds at the, at the state level that you can apply for. And green funds um, are new to the state and they have an evolving set of criteria. So partnership funds um, are available to developments that partner with housing authorities like, um, like ours, you know, like Howard County um, Housing Commission. And then the green funds is a newer source of funds. So, you know, literally it's, it's just off the books last year. Um, they're continually updating, but if you meet certain green criteria, um, there is funding that's available for that upcharge um, to create you know, you know, those often more expensive green components of the building. Um, so, so, you know, those are gonna be an important part of the overall financing package from the state. Um, they really like to try and have you um, use as many different buckets as possible. Sure, um, thank you. I appreciate that. That was one of the um, things I noticed. And um, I don't know if this question is better suited for um, Mr. Lubley or Ms. Catronio, um, but in reading through this, we have about, it looks like 15 students um, for elementary school, uh, as the other two would not be impacted by APFO. But we've got 15 students spread across five grades, spread across, say, four classes, but three classes to make it easier. So that's about one extra child per class per grade. So what sort of mitigation strategies would you be pursuing for that? Or do you think they would be needed? Good afternoon. I'll try and take a first step at this uh, question. Um, I think what you're, the point that you're bringing up is very important that the current projected yield is 15 students per 
elementary school, which would be distributed throughout the entire elementary school. Um, the 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 assistance or the needs that would be provided would be based on the quantity of students that went into each classroom and each grade. So it's a difficult question to particularly answer at this time, but the school system is um, or does provide the needs of all of its students. We would continue to provide any and all supports that are needed by new and existing students. I know that doesn't really answer your question, uh, but it's a difficult question to specifically address at this time without knowing the particulars of how many of those 15 students would be in each grade and per each class and okay. what the specific needs would be for each of those students. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, and then I'll, um, can I, can I, so can I add on? Um, I, I really just want to get my last question in Ms. Catronio. I only have 50 seconds left, <laughs> um, but I can certainly follow up with you after this. Um, because one of the unique um, aspects of this project is the community building aspect, the inclusive nature, the intentional nature of this living. And so um, I guess Ms. Kletz and, or Mr. Dunham or others on the call from Patuxent Commons, um, how have you seen those relationships cultivated? And I think you only have 30 seconds now. Michael. Sure, I'll be, I'll be very fast. Uh, we're basing this on the learned experience from other communities around the country that have adapted this strategy. It typically goes like this community events that get residents out of their individual apartments into the collective uh, common space and intentional connections um, between uh, people, personality matches basically that the facilitator helps create with the neighbor to neighbor social support program. So it's activities and, and light staffing together. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Um, we'll be moving on to CB7, which is well, I, it is CB7. Um, <laughs> we have with us uh, Amy Gowan from Director Amy Gowan from DPZ, uh, Brian Schepter, and Ms. Simino. Um, each council member will have 10 minutes. Ms. Walsh, would you like to start or would you like? Um, I'm happy to go first. When, when, when did we find out about the, this 10, 11 minutes? Do we have less time for the last one? Do we have like eight minutes for the last one? No, no, no. They're all, uh, the first one was 11 and the other were 10. We gave the um, times, I think, earlier this morning. This is actually a throwback to um, Ms. Young's chairing of the budget. It worked so well and everyone was really able to share time. Wait, no, that's not my question. When did we sure. find out today? When did we find out that today's testimony or back and forth? I mean, you just caught Ms. Catonio off, a board member, from yes. answering a question. And that was not um, how so I did it. I would it. actually like to use some of my time to go back to Ms. Catronio and get whatever comment she's going to add to our discussion of the past bill. Sure. Um, but I don't, I don't think this is necessarily a fair way to approach something where someone may just have like one clarification about it um, and want to talk at length about a different one. So I, I get why you might put time limits in. I may not agree on it. Um, but maybe there would be a way for us to say, I would like to use all of my whatever total allotment in these ways versus you get 11 minutes for this thing you don't care about and 11 minutes for something you could talk about for two hours. So, um, but uh, if it is possible, I would like to extend the courtesy of allowing um, an elected board member to, to make the point or ask the question or clarify whatever, whatever that offer was partially made. Um, Cause we do, we ask people to attend these, these work sessions to add to our public discussion about these pending matters. So I would like the benefit of that if that's at all possible. And I'm happy to minus that from my CB7, whatever the count is. And okay, I have no just, questions for CB7. So that, that gives okay. us a, an exceptional amount of time. All right. So again, um, just to go back to answering Ms. Walsh's question, the administrator emailed each of you last week to say that time would be divided equally. They were all, you were also given the agenda total, the total time on the agenda. Not much has changed, it's, it's more the specification from that time, I think, um, that you received this morning. But, you know, we're all doing the best we can in trying to balance the time and manage the meetings. And I felt that this way was fair and gave people equal time to you. And each council member was able to use their time within their, within their time allotted as they saw fit. So um, I really wanted to, you know, 
I heard from Mr. Lubley. I'm happy to follow up from for Ms. Catronio because I also want the answer to her question, but I didn't want to violate the time we had left, and I thought it would be, and I really wanted to hear the answer from um, Patuxent Commons, who I frankly have less of a relationship with than I do Ms. Catronio. So that's why I organized my time on that agenda session um, the way that I did. So I'm, I'm really trying my best here to adjudicate the meeting. Um, I've communicated the time and the timing to each of you, um, and I would appreciate respect for the process as we go through this meeting. Um, so let's begin, Ms. Walsh. Ms. Um, Ramey, before we get off of that topic, can I chime in? Um, I, I love that we're trying to be expeditious and not waste time, um, which I know we, get, we do get off topic sometimes in these, and I get that. Um, but we've talked about this before. I think that these public conversations with all of the stakeholders and all the experts together and us hearing what each other person's asking, it maybe prompts us to ask a question or get information that we might have thought to ask for is a ton more valuable than just separate meetings. So I just, I just think it, Agreed. Wh while, I, while I certainly don't want to be here all day, I don't want to waste time, I think that people do need to be prepared for this to get tabled if we didn't if we don't feel like Agreed. we had enough time to talk and that I think that's the balance so one of the issues so. in balancing that though is that and we've talked about this throughout our time together but the last time that this sort of body met in administrative capacity to discuss our intentions around our sessions we clarified that working sessions were really for people to dig deeper and so that's up to each council member what they need to go deeper on is different for each person and Unfortunately, you know, there are things that we're all very passionate. I, I know Ms. Young and I could probably go for five hours on protection comments, but that's not necessarily the depth of information that's needed here. I mean, there are, there are questions that are more preparatory questions that were asked that could have been, you know, received prior to this time, but have been instead used for this time. There are a lot of options, and each council member has different things that are important to them. They utilize their time and work sessions very differently. Um, but this is really a way to ensure that each person has equal opportunities. Whether they use those opportunities or not is one thing, but it doesn't mean we're entitled to other people's opportunities. It means we're entitled to use our own opportunity. So, you know, good news guys, you only have me for one meeting. <laughs> you, you get to go back to Dr. Jones. Um, I, I'm just trying to do the best I can given the circumstances we have. If, well, he, I, please don't interrupt me, Miss Young. If it is, if, you know, for whatever reason there's information that people don't have at this time or they didn't get it, everything, if they didn't organize themselves within that time, I, I'm not sure. But, you know, I don't have an issue this one time with going back to getting Miss Catronio's comment. Um, but, but I am just trying to keep the trains running. Ms. Young? As a county council, we meet at most once a week. And at the very least, what we can do is get as much information out to the public during that period of time. And this is not, from my perspective, just for us to sit here and get questions answered. Rather, it is for the public to understand what these projects are about, what this piece of legislation is about, as well as to potentially spur other members of the county council to ask questions that are related. To think that we can't put more than two hours a week in a public setting in order to ensure that people are are understanding what it is that we are voting on is that's just sad to me um, and I think that it is I think it's inappropriate I think that we should be ensuring that we get questions answered even if we already have the information to some of the questions not because we just didn't bother to read but because we want to make sure that the public is aware of these questions and these answers as well. So not only 
would I agree with Mr. Youngman about the idea that having these questions come up in a work session can spur our colleagues to think of other things that they might also want answered and to understand the thinking of our colleagues. I also think that these se sessions are equally important for the public to understand what we're thinking and to understand the, the legislation that's in front of us. All right. Well, thank you for your feedback. Um, I still see that we have Ms. Catronio on. Um, Ms. Catronio, did you want to respond? And I'm sorry, I'm on my iPad and I couldn't find the unmute button. So I think Dan Lubley took one for the team and, and answered for me, so I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to say that we'd have to understand, you know, the actual number of students. I mean, um, Riverwatch has 22 elementary schools. That was three years ago. And that is a that is, I mean it doesn't sound like a lot, especially if it's spread of, uh, um, amongst grades. But you have to remember the the school is the big deal. If the the course facilities are small, like at Clemens Crossing, they're very small. This year they, or two years ago, they had a lot of trouble with the bus loop because their their community school and went after redistricting, they were at 9,500 percent, and they didn't even have enough room for the buses um, to line up at that school. So there's there's things that we don't necessarily think of right away when we we talk about um, a school going over capacity um but it, it does matter um and i think 15, uh, you know 15 students that would be great if that's the number but the way that um I'm, when i looked at riverwatch it was you know 22 and it's at that point it was only one phase of Riverwatch, so um probably pretty comparable um uh to what uh types of commons it's going to be Sure, we can, you know, try to do things to mitigate. We can um, add another portable, um, but we have to remember that the course facilities are small too, and it, it may even, you know, if it's in one grade, that means you have to get another teacher or another class. So there are impacts, um, but I'm not negating the, the, the potential to do this, but it's just there's things that, you know, you don't necessarily think of right away um, when, you, when you're thinking about capacity. I didn't think about bus loops or transportation when I was doing redistricting. And now that that now that's at the forefront because I've heard from schools, it's, it's a big problem with the congestion at their schools. Thank you. I think that that definitely puts, definitely um, puts um, more definition, more onto, definition onto uh, what Mr. Lubley said when he was saying that it, we don't know what they are, but they will, there'll be something essentially. It's hard to future cast. Thank you very much. Ms. Walsh.